All right, welcome to the Vaccine Team Podcast. This is where we're answering the multitude of questions and we get to get a little bit more in depth with the questions that many of you are having at home. I'm very excited to be joined by Keith Grant. He is the Senior System Director for Infection Prevention at Hartford Hospital and also has been involved with helping plan for vaccine distribution with the Governor's Task Force on this. So Keith, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us to shed some light. Absolutely, Kara. Thanks for having me. You know, everyone wants a vaccine. I'm hearing this. Uh, should I go to another state? Should I go here? Should I, you know, I'm trying to get online. Uh, what's your advice to people who are really revving to try and get this vaccine? Uh, um, no, first, keep up the enthusiasm. And uh, secondly, I'd say be patient. I know it's really difficult at this time, but um, keep in mind, we have general terms. We have about 3.5 plus million people in Connecticut that we're, we're planning to try to get to vaccinate. And um, our ability to expand um, has been proven by moving from 1A to 1B. And seemingly we're doing a pretty good job. I think we're about 35% of the 75 plus population right okay. now in Connecticut. So that's, that's very good. Still some road to go, but just be a tiny bit patient and we'll definitely get, get to you guys. So it's 1B. That's the group that we're in right now. And in case people miss the memo, you can't go unless it's your group has been called. It's kind of like being at a wedding. you got to wait for that table to be called. And there's no way of kind of circumventing that. Like you have to make an appointment online and be part of 1B, which is a 75 and up emergency health care workers. Who else is in that group? So, so 1B, the one group within 1B that we're focusing on right now is a 75 plus. Okay. Um, within 1B, there's other individuals to include, you know, your individuals with comorbid conditions, 16 um, plus, and there's individual critical care, critical infrastructure that we're also going to be getting to, to include like our teachers and so forth. So 1B is very expansive. In fact, 1B throughout Connecticut will equate to about 1.4, 1.2 million individuals. Wow. So we're going to be in 1B for a while. For a good while. So, we, well, you know, the, the rate of how we change our tier system is increasing significantly. Reasons why, like our ability to upscale, we've had to, you know, learn um, really quickly. So what we were vaccinating, the, the number of vaccination we're delivering two weeks ago, that's improved or increased exponentially today. And a week from now, it's going to improve even more. So massive centers are going to be going up. So we will need to get to the 75 plus and 1Bs very quickly in order to, for, to expand it to the entire population. So much more to come. There's a lot of work being done on this. And, and when you say you're getting a lot more and we're getting more in the pipeline, is that just because the companies are able to make more or is it a change in the administration in Washington? What's, what's the factor? Well, the change in the in, in the administration, I don't I don't know if I would say it absolutely helped. What we can say is there's a commitment to procure two hundred million more vaccine that definitely will help us. Um, I know with what we've had, so Connecticut's used, I think, consistently about 73, 75% of the vaccine allocated to Connecticut so well that Connecticut got a I think an extra fifty thousand dosage about two weeks ago, as you know, being ranked third or fourth in the country for distribution really, really helps. Wow, we're uh, doing well. Exactly. So we're doing well. But when you think about like what we've done, right? So 75, 73% of what we've been allocated. Imagine if we were getting 200,000, 100,000 more dosage, that would really stretch the logistic of actually distributing these dosage. So I think the timeline by itself, there is some bottleneck that we really have to appreciate that's being rectified by learning, increasing efficiencies, um, applying more resources and so forth. So it will take more time. So it's not just the fact that, you know, there's a change in administration. Um, I think uh, companies are, you know, Johnson & Johnson is going to be entering the fray real soon. Uh, companies such as Moderna and Pfizer have committed to increase their production as well. Uh, so there's a multitude of factors. Okay. So let's talk about the new vaccine that has come out recently, uh, Johnson & Johnson's one-dose vaccine. Some people might say, okay, this reported 66% effectiveness doesn't sound as good as the 95%, but you say in some ways, this might actually be the better vaccine or the one that we start using more. Yeah, so I don't, I, I think, you know, it's very, it's hard to really appreciate the full scale of what the if efficacy of this vaccine will be. And, you know, when they speak about it, the infectious disease, the primary infectious disease um, person for Johnson & Johnson um, speak about the fact that 
what they saw was an increase in efficacy as, as, as time went on from the point of vaccination, which we can expect. Sometimes it takes a while before immunity actually matures and we have an increase. So that, that 60, 66, 72% that we see right now, we might see an increase in numbers. Some believe that we might see numbers within the 90%, but you know, still much more to go. The fact still remain from a logistical perspective, um, it, it will be a very a much easier vaccine in order to one distribute, to administer, um, to store. You know, there's no need to cons to freeze the vaccine, and it's a single dose as you stated before. Yeah. So the logistic of bringing someone in for a second dose very very complex, very complicated. Something yeah. that we're dealing with now with the two vaccines that we have. I think a lot of moms can relate just trying to remember to get back to get those other vaccines when your children are young and going back. I mean, if people don't go back to get that second dose, are they really not protected? Or are they worse off than if they had gotten the one dose from Johnson & Johnson? That's a very good parallel, right? So if people don't go back, what we know, so it's not in the data that we have from the trials from Pfizer and Moderna, it's not a close, not an absolute data and the primary reason if you had just let these individuals go without getting the second dose and keep retesting them, there's a probability that there would have been an increase in immunity, right? So it's very difficult. So after 14 days of the first dose and tested with, um, with the data coming from Moderna and Pfizer, um, the Johnson Johnson vaccine at that point seems to be superior. But again, Pfizer and Moderna was able to achieve within the 90% um, when, uh, when given the second dose after 14 days. So. Where are we getting our vaccines from here in Connecticut? Where are ours being produced or how are they coming in? Pfizer Moderna is a primary across the country right now. I think um, Johnson & Johnson hasn't even gotten EUA approval yet. Uh, they're very, very close um, with the promise of, I think, 7 to 32 million by April if EUA is granted. So that's a very, it's a very big promise and it would help exponentially across, across the state, across the country. So uh, is there like one place that they're coming from? I, I knew there were some factories in Michigan or like, does it matter we're in Connecticut or ours are coming from New York or uh, we don't know where they're coming from. Yeah, I could. Do they arrive less. on planes? How are we getting them? I could care less. There's a truck that shows up on Monday okay. morning. And <laughs> I have vaccines and I'm excited. And I just think we need to figure out how to, you know, educate individuals to kind of reduce that vaccine hesitancy piece of it and, and move forward. Well, you had the vaccine. Yes, I did. And how did it feel? Did you have any side effects, any aches, pains? Second dose. So the first dose it was completely um, pretty boring. I was, I was pretty excited as one of the first people to get the vaccine. So, you know, um, I have colleagues who are very scientifically, scientific minded. So I was get phone calls every 15 minutes so they could jot down my symptoms on a graph just to see what's going on. And primarily so they can decide if they're taking it or not, right? And then nothing happened, right? The second dose was more interesting. Second dose, I had more um, fatigue, more lethargy. Felt like I ran like a, like a half a marathon. I, I felt pretty pretty tired. Um, and which is consistent with what you think scientifically what's happening because your body's actually now have created the antibody and, and memory from the first dose. Yeah. And that's kind of what it's doing is trying to uh, uh, mount a defense and, and produce antibodies again uh, from the second dose. Yes, I have heard from a couple of people who've had it that they had more of symptoms on the second dose. I had the real COVID, and I would say the one symptom that is still a struggle is getting all my energy back. The fatigue really wiped me out. And um, so I think I'm maybe 95%, but that's over a month later. Um, so when I used to go to the gym, I don't feel like really doing much, any like light exercise. So we don't have to expect, it's, it's a lot better than getting the real thing, right? I mean, you're talking about a day or two versus, you know, I was really out of commission for quite some time, maybe, you know, closer to two weeks at least. Good. And that's, you see, these are the stories that we have to be re able to relate to. And, you know, we're in a very good position. Connecticut is keep reducing its numbers over the last few, few days. And, you know, in, in the hospital systems, admissions for COVID patients are reducing mortality rate is getting much, much better. So we're looking, we're in a very good position, but we have to keep in mind that the individuals who really suffered from this disease um, had side effects and had some individuals had severe illnesses. And obviously we see the mortalities that are affiliated with it. And all of these vaccines give, generally give a significant hope to at least reduce the impact. If you, even if you do get sick, right? So if you look at 
you know, one of the numbers we don't talk about a lot. So the Pfizer Moderna vaccine, 94, 95% effective. But if you look at that individual number of individuals who actually got the virus with the vaccine on board, their course of illness was significantly better than the placebo group who didn't have the vaccine on board. So what we do know is even with the individuals who don't, um, who do get infected, the vaccine and the antibodies that's there gives some protective and protection during the course of illness. And, and in fact, uh, I'm not part of 1B yet, so I'm not eligible for the vaccine. But those of us who have had COVID are still recommended to get the vaccine? That's correct. And the primary reason is because, you know, we know that antibodies um, uh, are reduced over time with the, with, the, with the virus, being exposed to the virus. Um, and the, what we do know so far is individuals who've gotten the vaccine, I think the studies from individuals who were in the trials in August and so forth, has not, has not decreased or no reduction in your antibodies at, at this point. The other part of it is very difficult to see what the efficacy of the antibodies that you naturally create from exposure to the virus itself. And um, having the trials regarding the COVID-19 vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna, we, we have, you know, it's over 90%. So it's a significant difference. Yeah, I mean, I've been reading that even when you talk about the, the it's not 100% effective, but it is, I guess, 100% effective of keeping people out of the hospital and dying. There we go. That's brilliant. That's exactly true. And I think that's one way to look at it. So when individuals, like the 5% is something we need to talk about because, you know, if you, you the 5%, if the 5% you're getting, the, and I think that's one of the most important subgroup. So people actually getting ill or getting the virus, having the vaccine on board does much better um, with the course of illness. It's pretty significant. What about people who say, oh, I don't ever get vaccine. I never get the flu shot. I think I have allergies. Are there some people who shouldn't get this? You know, I would say anyone that's um, uh, within a community that has the potential to be exposed or being exposed to someone that's e either a high risk, so someone within healthcare, or someone high risk for getting the, the virus or being exposed to the virus, or someone that's high risk for mortality. So the grandparents, older people within the family or people with comorbid conditions. You might not necessarily be, you know, I had an interesting conversation actually this morning where you know, a friend of my wife's got, um, got uh, she's asymptomatic, um, got a phone call and um, they had a get together. And in, during the get together, I guess she got tested two or three days after that um, because she started having some symptoms and subsequently six people from that group became ill. Unfortunately, one person within that group, their grandparent is now a member of the grandparent um, group, is now in the hospital in the critical care unit. And she was um, felt very guilty, very upset about the fact that she potentially was the one that the index patient who brought it over. Mm -hmm. So this is someone that very mild symptoms would have done very, very well with the disease process. But the fact that there's a potential, people like myself and, and you um, are very good vectors. And this is why this disease, this virus is very, very smart, very effective, very smart. So you have individuals about, in some community, about 80% of individuals have mild to no symptoms which means they have the potential to go have normal conversation, normal social events and pass it on. If this was a disease process wherein you get it, you're sick, you're home or in the hospital and that's it. There's, there's no gray area. Then this disease would have, I wouldn't say ceased to exist by now, but it would be significantly less um, mm. in motion to multiple people. But do we know that if we get the vaccine that we can't spread it? Oh, we, we know that if we do get the vaccine, you have the capability of still carrying the virus. Okay. Your nears and, um, and other and, and, uh, and the respiratory system. So you have the, the, the ability to carry it. And this, is, this has been proven um, from studies after individuals had 14 days off. You don't say, oh, I had the vaccine. I'm good. Come give me a hug. Oh, absolutely not. Definitely not. That's not that. That is not a good idea. Okay. Good idea. And the same thing for those of us who've recovered from COVID and have some antibodies. Could I still? It may be less likely, but could I still give it to somebody? You could. Okay, I'll give you an easy way to think about this. So remember, really early in this, we we had the conversation of whether or not a table can potentially carry the virus. So you could have a virus on the table, and it's not 
it's not hard to, to the table isn't really moving anywhere i'm yeah. within the hospital consistently i'm seeing patients consistently um within different environment there's a potential for me to pick it up and carry it with me so yeah yeah so it's yeah. now uh if let's just talk about getting the vaccine the first thing you do you go online is there one portal that everyone goes to just to remind people yeah, so CT, uh, the Connecticut State website has a very easy way to navigate individuals. I think there's a huge COVID-19 banner that's on there. Click on it and it will bring you through the whole process to vaccination. Hartford Healthcare, um, same exact thing. You go onto Hartford Healthcare website and it will navigate you through the whole process. Both websites have a phone number um, that's in multiple languages that okay. provides contact in multiple languages that can help individuals through the actual process itself, which I think is very well needed and very one of probably the most important piece of this process. Is the biggest challenge just getting this vaccine to as many people as quickly as possible? You know, everything we're reading over the last few weeks, especially with the new variances, that is our biggest challenge. That is going to be our biggest challenge. And I think one of the things that you know, we build this really good system based on our existing healthcare system, but we have to appreciate the fact that healthcare in general isn't, hasn't been accessed by every single person. Like, and we've seen this based on this, this what this, um, the areas that this virus really, really affected or significantly impacted. So we have to figure out how to not just be the healthcare system that we were before COVID, but we need to be much, much better. And this is not just for Hartford Healthcare. This is for as a healthcare community overall. So that's one thing that we're struggling with trying to figure out. And partnerships within the communities is one thing we're working on really, really well, is how do we partner with the individuals within the community who has a voice, um, who has a leadership voice and can spread the, the, the message itself, but help people to get to our system in order to get the vaccine. So that's something we're working on. Yeah, okay. So the other thing being that um, so many people who aren't used to accessing the healthcare system through a traditional way, maybe they don't have insurance, maybe uh, they might just go to the ER. Are you gonna be able to get a vaccine at the ER when it's your turn or no? Not at this point in time, but I soon enough, you know, that has to be something we explore because remember, there's a lot of people who use the emergency department, as you stated, as like a primary care. Yeah. So we have to figure out how to include that as a part of our distribution prospect. And again, over time, there's so much we're learning from this and so much we have to appreciate. But at this point, with the groups that we're getting to, or the groups that we've been tasked to facilitate in 1B, um, we're doing a reasonably good job. But that's a tiny sub for, subgroup of the entire group that we're going to need to get to very soon. So we have a lot, a long way to go. Crystal ball question. When do we have enough people vaccinated that the world can start returning to normal <laughs> in Connecticut? Uh, I'll give you my theory, like really quick theory, right? So um, the overall theory is about 75, 70%. That's what we're looking at. So the, for herd immunity. So if you look at the state of Connecticut, you know, 3.5 million, you can do the math, right? Um, however, so if you look at this scenario, if you have a single individual, you have three people, you have one person that's vaccinated in the middle. This person becomes positive, right? This individual is the person that is probably the elder person. So this is a social butterfly. Person is here, elder person with comorbid condition. The person that you really want to be vaccinated is this person. That's 33%. So the benefits of like, when you look at this big picture of getting 70 to 80% vaccinated, it's huge, right? But the impact that this has, so if you look at a subgroup such as the nursing homes, right, we're seeing benefits in the nursing homes. We're seeing significant benefits now in the nursing homes. And Connecticut's only about 10% of its population that's been vaccinated right now, right? That's, we're right. nowhere near, but we're yeah. already seeing some benefits. Okay. All right. So I, that was a good analogy, but what about the when? Is it summer? Is it fall? Again, I won't hold you. Just people are wondering, like, even I'm hearing that we want to get the teachers vaccinated so kids can go back to school full time instead of hybrid. Like, do you see that happening this year? I do see that happening this year. You do? I really do. I do see a different, I do see that happening this year for a number of reasons. Um, it's encouraging where the numbers are going right now. I know the variances are, you know, something of a discussion. It's encouraging what the vaccines the efficacy overall is having with the variances. So that's a good thing. 
it's encouraging where um, national compliance is with you know, masking and proper social distancing and so forth. If you look at New York, I think this afternoon they announced the fact that they will be allowing for Valentine's Day about 20 restaurants to be reopened at 25% capacity. That's a big move for New York. Um, if you look at uh, other new rules and states within in the country um, responding to their numbers, where there's some big gains and positives that's, that are happening. So that's good. Okay. But I do believe a lot's going to change over the next few months. A lot of it is predicated on the education about the vaccine and keep looking at our prevalence and our numbers. And lastly, just because now people are hearing about the new variants, are these variants going to negate our progress? I don't know if it's going to negate our progress. I think one of the good things with the variants is I'm now seeing more vigilance. So I'm now seeing people are now, you know, there's a time when we had very high numbers in Connecticut and, you know, very quickly Connecticut became one of the best states in our prevalence drop, you know, individuals were very um, vigilant in ensuring that they're wearing the proper PPE and being socially distanced and so forth. And then I think we, we had like this level of, you know, we're tired and fatigue of this whole process. And, you know, I think this is a reminder for us that, you know, there's, it's, this is still a very dangerous disease process. One variant seemed to be about 70% more contagious. There's one variant that we're looking at that um, renders some, inef um, some uh, ineffectivity from the actual vaccine itself, um, reduces the effect of the, the vaccine. So we're looking at that as well. So I think what it does is it just reminds us how dangerous and deadly this could be. And the timeline that we do have in order to mitigate this through what we have now, which is a vaccine. Any chance these vaccines are going to protect us from the variant? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So if you look at the one variant, the B151, um, that primarily is protected right now. Uh, B117 is protected right now. B1351 is the one that we're more challenged with at this point because B1351 is a South African variances, variance, and we're studying and learning more about this. But we do believe that there's some, and if you look at the Johnson & Johnson study, it actually shows that in South Africa, it's actually less F. Um, effective than it was in the U.S. population, which could be attributed to the South African variants, but we're still, that's preliminary data, we're learning more. Um, but what we do know for the UK variants, which is B117, that variants is, um, seem to be protected by, okay. um, by Pfizer Moderna. We're learning more every day. So uh, I want to thank you, Keith Grant, for being on, for educating people who are listening. And if you are listening, we're going to have many more podcasts right here on the vaccine team where we get to pick the brilliant minds of people like Keith to answer all the questions that everyone's talking about around the dinner table. We wanna get the facts out there. Awesome, thanks Kira. Thank you so much.